So when you talk about uh, India, South Asia, it's very, very unique because we have a huge amount of diversity exists in the population. Uh, even without doing any genetics, by looking at their feature, phenotypic feature, one can tell about the population in general. There are population in India who typically look like Africans, as you see here. Right? And there are people who are with the very light skin color, look like uh, Europeans. There are people who are with the features of Southeast Asia. And there are people who doesn't appears like anybody, but they are very, very unique to India. So that's the diversity we have in India and South Asia's agenda. So what is unique again in India or South Asia is that the populations are very well stratified in many ways. So one of the stratification is based on the language. There are several language groups, particularly there are four major linguistic groups. One is uh, the Dravidians, people who live in southern part of India, we speak uh, Dravidian language. Uh, people in this particular area who speak uh, Austroasiatic language. And the third one, uh, Tibeta Burman. People live in northeast and northern part of India speak Tibeta Burman language. And uh, the majority of the people who are in the north speak Indo European language. These are the four major linguistic groups. Again, under each linguistic group, there are several languages. In addition to this broad linguistic group, there are several isolated languages like the Andamanis. Within Andamanis, each one of them speak their own language, like Onge speak different language compared to Great Andamanis and others. Uh, there is another language called Nihalis. These are all isolated languages. Uh, under each linguistic group, again, we have large number of social structures. A social structure in the sense there is a caste system, there's a religious group, and if you see that in the, in the caste, we have sub-caste, breeding isolates, exogamous unit. Again, same way in the tribes, you see the similar structure, religious group. What is even more interesting is that every single endogamous unit, they marry within the group. They don't marry outside. That is being practiced for the last several thousands of years. So that makes every population unique because they acquire unique set of mutation in this process. So what makes these kind of uniqueness is that in India, we have large number of population groups, 4,635 anthropologically well-established population groups that includes caste, uh, tribes, 532, 72 primitive tribes, half of them still follow hunters and gatherers. Right? That means they go and hunt for food in the jungle, they don't do any job, including the agriculture. Uh, in terms of identifying uh, how old the population is in India, South Asia, so one of the great source is the ancient DNA. But unfortunately, unlike many other countries because of the climatic conditions, we don't have a very good archaeological source. So this is one of the excavations where they found only the tools which probably the modern human must have used but they didn't find any biological remains. But only the success uh, ancient DNA analysis uh, that was uh, led by David, who will be talking after me, and Vashant and then we are all part of it and successfully sequenced uh, this bone sample found in Arapa region. Um, but that's not really telling about uh, the origin of people in the Indian subcontinent because this sample is not very old, around three to 4,000 BCE, but this sample consists of uh, the ancestral uh, South Indians and Iranian hunter-gatherers, okay? But uh, I'll not go into detail, but in terms of origin of people in India or South Asia, it's not giving much of information. But having population with, uh, uh, very strong practice of endogamy, uh, we felt that analyzing the genetic composition of a large number of Indian groups might tell us about uh, the history, when did the modern human arrive, and so on. Uh, while doing this, we found uh, the first modern human probably arrived in the Indian subcontinent uh, is none other than 
the tribal populations of Andaman and Nicobar Islands. I don't know how many of you are aware this population would typically look like Africans. And we, uh, there are several islands, 572 islands, four tribal groups who typically look like Africans. Two of them look like Southeast Asian groups. We collected the sample from Onge, uh, Great Andamanis, and the saliva sample from another tribal groups, Jarwa. And we processed that initially with uh, the mitochondrial uh, genome analysis. I'm not going to detail, Sarah already mentioned about it. And what was interesting is that uh, uh, the mutation which we found in Andaman tribes are very unique, which has not been reported or not been found anywhere else in the, in, in the world. And uh, by calculating the, uh, the mutation rate, and we came to the conclusion that uh, the Andamanis are the, probably the first modern human who migrated out of Africa and uh, taking southern coastal route reached Andaman and Nicobar Islands about 65,000 years back. So this is the first genetic evidence suggesting that the first modern human who migrated out of Africa are the Andaman tribes. So this is where um, we uh, collaborated, uh, myself, uh, Dr. Lali Singh and uh, David, uh, from here on, we took a different uh, aspects of uh, looking at the population history in India. Uh, with David, we uh, looked at the nuclear genome marker, that's uh, Affymetrix Array uh, 6.0, consisting of 1 million SN2 markers. We carefully choose uh, out of 20,000 uh, samples uh, representing Dravidians, Indo-European, Austroasiatic, Tibetan, and also so-called the social groups. And we analyzed, and uh, just give you uh, uh, very briefly that uh, uh, the analysis showed that uh, there's a PCA showing that these are all different Indian groups. These are hap map samples of European, African, and Chinese. Uh, this tells how complex the Indian populations are, while these three uh, hap map samples clustering very tightly, suggesting that genetically they are more homogeneous, whereas here every single population is uh, very unique, but still there's a genetic affinities between these uh, groups. Um, in this process, we also found that um, uh, while Andaman is migrating, some group must have stayed in southern part of India, whom we call as ancestral South Indian. Later on, there's a migration towards uh, North and one group has come to Northern part of India and other group uh, gone to Europe. And these two founding groups, ancestral South Indian and ancestral North Indians, have uh, admixed, gave rise to many populations. And to understand that when did this admixture must have took place, again, it took large number of population from South and uh, North, again, using the same markers. And we could establish that uh, the ancestral South Indian and ancestral North Indians have initially gave rise to many population groups. And uh, during the last two to 4,000 years, approximately, these two founding groups have admixed. And uh, uh, after that, uh, last nearly 2,000 years, these populations started maintaining the endogamy. So they admixed, then the endogamy, and why the endogamy? Probably the caste system, which I insisted in the beginning, must have put more pressure on the population to maintain the endogamy marriage practice. Uh, in terms of the health and disease, if you look at what is the consequences of the endogamy. That's what we are going to see now. Uh, to understand that, we took again large number of populations uh, within India and also in other South Asian countries, including Sri Lanka, Nepal, um, uh, Pakistan, and many other uh, countries. Uh, we used and found that uh, there is a possibility of identifying large number of population-specific rare disease in this process, because large number of population in India and South Asia, they practice the endogamy marriage practice, particularly <clears throat> population in the southern part of India, they follow uh, the consanguinity, that means marrying within the uh, families. And here the IBD score says that 
uh, the large number of Indians, every line represents one population, are showing with high IBD score uh, compared to the Ashkenazi Jewish and Finnish population that you all know that uh, they are known for population specific, uh, large number of population specific recessive disease. But, but unfortunately, we don't have uh, any information about the population specific rare disease in uh, India, except very few diseases. To give you an uh, idea about what is known in Ashkenazi Jewish and Finnish population, you can see that large number of diseases, most of them are autosomal recessive disease. Again, in Finnish population. How that happened? This is a pedigree, what you see here. Uh, this is a uh, female, a male, married, and there are two daughters. And consider that there is a mutation here particularly recessive mutation, which will uh, cause the disease only when there's a two copies of recessive mutations are there. So as long as that it exists in the heterozygous condition, no problem, because it's passing on generation after generation in a heterozygous condition. But after several generations, these two, now they actually are losing the track of their relationship, but they have come from a common ancestor. But now these two individuals they think that they are unrelated, but they are in the same population. If they marry, carrying heterozygous mutation, that's when there's going to be a problem um, of transmitting both the recessive mutation. And when you have this kind of parents, there's a one third of uh, one fourth of chance of getting homozygous mutation. Therefore, there's a disease, and that was confirmed by uh, looking at. There's a disease called progressive pseudohermatoid dysplasia, where uh, there are 30 patients uh, who are come from southern part of India carrying the mutation in a homozygous condition. The parents are absolutely uh, normal, but they say that they are um, uh, unrelated individuals. But when we looked at the flanking region of mutation, which causes the disease, five out of the six are having same haplotype, suggesting that they must have come from a common ancestor. So not only this, there are several other diseases. This is one of the example where the polymerase gamma, there's a, a nuclear gene, but it's essential for mitochondrial DNA replications. And if the mutation is existing in the heterozygous condition, the parents are absolutely uh, fine, even after 40 years. But look at this family, the second sanguinous family, uh, the, the individual with uh, uh, homozygous mutation are uh, passing away or dying at very, very early age. Uh, these are, of course, there are some phenotypes which I want to go into detail. Uh, these are a non consanguineous family, but the same uh, population. You can see the parents are absolutely fine, heterozygous mutation, but the, the children are with the homozygous mutation and dying at very, very early age. So similarly, I think there are large number of such uh, recessive mutations, uh, which leads to uh, several diseases are existing in almost one third of the Indian population or uh, in, in South Asian populations. So that is going to be very, very challenging. We already started looking at some of this population sequencing and uh, trying to identify the mutation, which is responsible for that. So with that, uh, uh, I thank, uh, there's a large number of in, people are involved in that. My own colleagues, right from Dr. Lalji Singh to, to my students, and David has been an excellent collaborator and large number of uh, this continues. Uh, of course, the funding has come from different agencies. So with that, I thank for the opportunity. I hope I finish in time. Thank you very much.